All right. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Wassalat. Wassalam. Ala Sayyid al Mursaleen Muhammad al Amin. Amma Bad. This is a program that I've been wanting to do for a year, as you know. <laughs> so, Mashallah. Alhamdulillah. We're here. And uh, uh, Brother Fahim, uh, as he will introduce himself, inshallah, in a little bit. And may Allah protect him from any evil eye or and his family. Uh, but he is uh, really a model when it comes to. Uh, raising a Muslim family, uh, particularly here in the West. And so, um, inshallah, if you can introduce yourself, and then inshallah, I'll have some questions that I want to dive into, and then we'll take it from there, inshallah. Sure, sure. Uh, so my name is Fahim Mojawala, and uh, I was born in India, in Mumbai, and I was three when I came here. So I'm originally from India. My mother's from Pakistan. So I'm able to share the good and the bad and the ugly from both areas and uh, get away with it. Um, I got married in 1996 uh, and uh, my father passed away in 1998. And I moved to the Buffalo area in 2005. And I run a small business, uh, shipping and printing business on Grand Island, uh, seven minutes south of Niagara Falls. And I am... Uh, a constant learner uh, from people like you, Sheikh. Uh, really, I, uh, I'm, I'm honored. I'm undeserving. I really don't know why I'm here, but I just, I'm just doing what I do uh, and try to apply what I learn from people like you in terms of uh, parenting and in terms of just raising kids. But yeah, it's a, it's a consistent uh, struggle. But I'm honored to be here. Thank you for having me. So um, the reason that you know. Many of the families that are here in this Buffalo area are here because of the madrasa, as you know. And they all had these hopes that we're going to raise our children. And different things happen in this process, which I'm, I don't want to go into the details of that. But you're one of the few, uh, you know, that um, your, your, your children are good in deen. They're in super intelligent. They're good in... Dunya, I mean, I see uh, your son becoming one of the leaders of the future Muslim Ummah, inshallah. And, uh, and so, I mean, what did you do right? That even like parents that send their kids, let's say in the madrasa, uh, sometimes even they don't get it right. Uh, and, and they end up with kids with, you know, they, even though they know the deen in the sense, uh, but they somehow... Uh, didn't get it as right. I had uh, and also I with that, I don't want yeah. to like complicate the question, but how do you balance between like your work and your family? How much time are you giving to individual children? So like, yeah, so let me just open it up. So and that's great. And I and, and I love that. And uh, when you had called me, I, I, I didn't know what to say. And I, I took some notes and I, I, I wrote down five fundamental points. I wrote down five things that were that inshallah we will discuss. I'm going to read them out to you as I wrote them and then we'll we'll we'll, we'll break them down and then you can ask me questions. I think that's going to be the best. Mm -hmm. uh, number 1, ego is the enemy. You have to let it grow go you have to let it go in order to grow. Mm -hmm. So that's the the fundamental thing that I I've worked for 25 years to let go of the ego and unfortunately in parenting uh, that comes a lot, you know, like, uh, and, and we see that in the movie Matilda, you know, I'm big, you're small, I'm right, you're wrong, you know, and I'm, I'm strong, you're weak, and therefore I know it all. And that really leads to a lot of problems in parenting. Mm -hmm. Number two, uh, which is very essential to, to, to take notice uh, that we learn from uh, our teachers. Uh, I, I learned this from you as well. Uh, kids are an amana, they're not possessions. Kids are a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are entrusted to us as parents. They come from, uh, you know, they, 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 they're given to us as a gift and they're not possessions. So they shouldn't be taken care of as possessions. They should be taken care of as entrusted to us and they have to be given back. Mm. That's huge. Number three, when when this I learned from my uh, dear, dear mentor and my sheikh, when children are small, the father should be strict and the mother should be soft. And when they reach teenagers, it's very important to switch those roles. 
and and we don't a lot of times. Mm-hmm. I, I said that in a talk sometime, and and so many people came up to me and they said, "How do I make the switch?" And I said, "Well, you have to have open communication and mutual respect with your spouse, and you have to understand that this is what you're going to do." Uh, the dad becomes soft, and the mother becomes strict when the kids turn into teenagers. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, and and then and then ride that accordingly because if if there is not one person in the household that is going to hold uh, strictness or rules and protocols, they will not be followed. Mm-hmm. But those, this is the key is to switch those roles when the kids become teenagers. And my kids actually bring it up to me now, Alhamdulillah, my youngest is a teenager, and she brings it up to me uh, that you know she's seen that role actively switch over. Mm-hmm. Uh, number four, um, spending quality time with kids, and you mentioned about this balance, really put it on for those of us who have calendar schedules and who have, who use, you know, iPhone or Google calendars, put that, t- if you have to put it on the calendar, put it on the calendar. It makes feel, it makes the kids feel really good and really special. Write it down somewhere and actively spend quality time with their kids, whether it's board games and conversations. And you had mentioned that in several of your talks, uh, do not talk about homework and uh, other foolish things that are mundane to the kids on the dinner table. So when we're having conversation, let them lead the conversation and let them ask and talk about what they're interested in, whether it's nutrition or whether it's health and whether it's whatever, maybe it's politics and they want to talk politics. But if they want to talk about video games, then engage them in that conversation on the dinner table. And number five, differentiate between culture and deen and allow kids to make mistakes. Don't smother them, parent them. Those are my five points. Mm, Very good. Very comprehensive. Uh, Did you treat your uh, daughters differently from your son? Great question. Absolutely. Yes. hundred percent. And my boys will tell you that they will tell you that. And and this answer is not what most people are going to expect. Those people who are watching this are like, aha, they quote Desi Bandai. Of course he did. Well, it's totally opposite. Mm. In my household, I was the softie. I still am. My, my girls will tell you that, you know, mashallah, through your daughters, you, you will know my girls, they, they can get away really with a lot of things. I really shouldn't say this because maybe my daughters will watch this later on, but they know that they have, I mean, I'm, my daughters are my Achilles heel and they're my kryptonite. So um, it's it been a very, big struggle for me to say no to them. Uh, But then what happens is my wife has been really good, mashallah, in holding down the fort and and being uh, responsible enough to say no. And alhamdulillah, she and I have this response, you know, relationship that if they come to me, I will always say, okay, well, what did mom say? And if they come to me and they say, you know, mom said, no, I said, well, you know what, then I'm sorry, you can't have that sleepover now. Yeah, or that's key, they, because they I think a lot of parents, uh, the parents don't communicate about parenting, right? And so they're not on the same page. And, and the kids use that as a loophole. And they'll come back to the mother and say, well, dad said yes. Or, and, or they know which question to ask who, and then go to the other and say, well, dad said this, or mom said this. But when parents are on the same page and you were talking about switching that that's very very interesting to me um so that requires kind of like you know a conversation that okay we're gonna like you know now our girls are older so now you be strict with them you know and 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 so now you become like the prophet was to like fatima in some senses right and so um yeah so you did treat your daughters generally speaking more softly than the boys because Mm -hmm. and generally what happens culturally is we're actually stricter on the girls than the boys right yes yes and that's exactly yeah and we we've alhamdulillah in the buffalo area when we moved mashallah now there's so many activities for girls of all ages muslim girls of all ages but when we moved to here my wife and i specifically she fought a lot to find these activities halal activities for the girls so we were able to find proper you know channels for them to get swimming lessons and mashallah my oldest daughter is now married and she lives in texas Mm -hmm. and she is a licensed lifeguard she was able to get her lifeguarding properly through the proper channels in buffalo Mm -hmm. and she does brazilian jiu-jitsu mashallah and she's getting certified in that and she got her uh training in buffalo and she's continuing it in texas Mm -hmm. so i think it's very important for parents 
to show their kids, not just tell them, but show their kids that it's just like it's important for all the kids to be doing the dishes, it's equally as important for all the kids to be engaging in activities for their kids to utilize their mind, body, and spirit mm -hmm. in a way that is constantly in growth and in a way that it's, it's, it's constantly in providing value for themselves and for the people around them. If they're not growing spiritually and physically in, 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 in mind, spirit, and body, they're not going to be offering that growth to other people. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was the way that we kept them from screens. The other thing, in a side note, just FYI, and I still firmly believe this, um, inshallah, I, I plan to do this with my grandkids as much as possible, uh, keeping them away from screens uh, up until at least 13 or 14, believe it or not. When my kids went to pedi pediatricians, the pediatrician could not believe that they didn't have any phones on mm -hmm. them um, at that age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh me and Sheikh Tamer talk about the screen issue all the time. And it's so before I talk about screens, I want to mention uh, adding to what you were saying is that studies show that when a daughter treats his, when a, when a father treats his daughter right, then it, it establishes standard of how to be treated. Right? Because that's the first important male figure in their life. And if he's treating them with respect and gentleness and honor, then they automatically expect that from their husband, right? But if the, if the father is not aware of this, and then if she's, for example, married, then her, her standard, her first standard is not there, right? So now, even if, uh, you know, when she inshallah gets married, when any, any of our daughter, Muslim daughters get married, if they had good fathers, they're going to have a standard in their, in their mind, right? And, uh, and they're going to know, because a lot of times girls don't know that they're being abused even, right? Yeah. Uh, because it's like that the abusive love uh, situation. Yeah. So they'll be like quicker to make judgments and open, they'll feel they can talk to their parents. I have had so many sisters tell me that, I want a divorce, but I know my parents will never support me. Allah. And so we have this problem of divorce, which is really, really bad. And then, you know, then it, it adds complications. But anyway, my main point here was the father treating the daughter with gentleness adds that standard by which she'll know this is how uh, men need to treat me. Right. hundred percent. My, my daughter for the first two years of her marriage used that as a litmus test and as a, as a club in front of my son-in-law. SubhanAllah, there, there, there's times, I think my son-in-law, when he watches this, there's times I feel bad for him because, you know, she, she keeps, you know, he, he told me, he said, Abuji, you've raised the bar so high. I don't think I can compete. And mm -hmm. I said, as long as you feel that way, mashallah, you'll be fine. Yeah. Mashallah. Allah mazid, Allah mazid. So, um, so yeah, now coming to, um, one of the big, okay, let's talk about the screen. The screen. Me and Sheikh Tamer talk a lot, uh, and especially Tamer talks a lot about, you know, generally when we're together, he'll talk a lot about the screen time and what to do about it. And he really thinks it is the cause of a lot of problems. And one of the key things that we're looking at, and I want your advice on this actually, uh, is that we're finding kids are completely unmotivated nowadays, like especially this newer generation and fifth grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, you know, uh, as they're growing, the, these, these kids, they, they have no ambition at all. It's like completely docile. And so uh, did you have to deal with that? How do you deal with that? What would your advice be? We have to recreate and reestablish conversations. If the parents are, you know, like this, when you come in the house, I've seen, I've seen this so many times with our families, you know, you're, you're talking, you can't, it's either the screen focus, discipline, consistency, and conversation. But with focus, with an active focus, we have to reestablish those conversations. If the parents themselves cannot take their hands and their attention off their screens, uh, and you know, mashallah, you know, Allah bless her. My mother's really good at, at pointing this out when I'm in a conversation with my mom now, um, she will stop talking to me if I have my phone with me. Oh wow! So it, 
you know, and so I, I'll put it down and I'll yeah, put and it. You're, face- you're a businessman. So you kind of like need that, you know? Yeah. Especially during the daytime, but I will, you know, in front of mom, I will put it face down. She'll see that it's face down and then she will engage in conversations. So I try to mimic that in a different tone, of course, with my kids. And I say, you know what, let's put the, let's put our, let's do it together. So the, di- the difference between a boss and a leader, most people are used to that whole boss mentality and that brings us into you know, how corporate America is also changing with emotional intelligence versus regular intelligence. And so the difference between a boss and a leader is very simple. The boss is, says, go, and the leader says, let's go or do let's versus do. let's do. And so in parenting is the same thing. Most of us have learned to be parents with the boss mentality. We just have to switch it over with a collaborative empathic mentality where let's do it together. And that's where you have to let go of the ego. Like mm-hmm. let's just because you're playing together with your child doesn't mean you're any less of a person. Doesn't mean you have any less respect. In fact, I would argue that you have more respect and more rub like Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, mm-hmm. you know, he was he had more rub, but the way he played with, you know, Aisha radiallahu anha, he played with the kids, Hassan and Hussein radiallahu anha, you see that if we are able to mimic that in that sense uh, with the kids at all different ages, I think it would change the game. But we have to start as parents. If we want their screen time limited, then we have to we have to limit our own screen time as soon as you get into the door in the house. Mm-hmm. That's the first thing I think. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of people struggle uh, with the screen time, both the parents and then if the parents, the parents know they can't tell the children if they're on the phone all the time. Yeah. And so definitely, I think there needs to be a curbing of that. And it's really having a detrimental effect, it seems like. Um, on Societally. On... Yeah, exactly. I mean, kids have phones and they start asking for phones when they're eight, nine years old. Yeah. And, and you know, so, okay, so moving on. Um, did you raise your kids the way your parents raised you or did you take a different approach because the default constantly, yeah we've constantly had to so I learned this is going to be I think you're, people are going to have to read between the lines this is a very uh, interesting question it's a little tricky but really I was taught um, this is what we did and actively we did it my wife and I when I say we I mean you know um, by the way, when, when, I, when I talk about parenting and I say, you know, my father taught me one and one is 11 when done right. Mm. So if, if we are on the same page, then uh, that's the first thing that happens. But secondly, the most important thing is this. Um, we were taught to pick the roses and leave the thorns. Mm. And so we collected all of the good things that, you know, m- from my in-laws and my own parents and what we felt that were the right things to impart to our kids. And then there was a lot of cultural baggage that naturally is in, in, in Desi homes. Mm. And you have to be self-aware and you have to be, you have to have the internal fortitude and courage to let that go Mm. and swim upstream Mm. and not do it, not repeat some of the mistakes that were made for the sake, like in my case, so that my father would get the ajar for that. So mm. I, I actually, we, we, we mentioned that to my kids that, you know, this is how my father did it, or did, this is how my mom did it. And this is a better way that we've learned. Why? Because it's closer to the sunnah. Mm. And so we've imparted that way in the, with the intention that our parents get the ajar for that. Mm. Yes. Mashallah, mashallah. You know, that's really, I think, the key, not blaming them, but rather taking it a step further that this is what they wanted. I'm sure this is what they wanted, but they didn't have the knowledge or the wherewithal or they didn't have the people around them to tell them. My father was, uh, subhanAllah, you know, my father, uh, I mean, as I told you privately, you know, he was a, a lover of the ulama and the scholars. He used to, one of, one of his biggest things, you know, I, you know, he was, he was generous beyond belief and, and loved to feed people, mashallah. And um, that's where I get my thing. You know, I uh, one of my biggest habits is I is I love to feed people, mm-hmm. and uh, my, my kids have that. And 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 feeding the guest is part and parcel of my entire family, especially my father's side, even my mother's side. Mashallah. You know, my my true fun fact: my 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 grandfather on my father's side, his his name was Karim, and my grandfather from my mother's side, his name was Ghani. So I am, you know, like it's exponentially generous. 
<laughs> mashallah, mashallah. You know, like this has got, it's in my blood to to give and 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 giving is not people people mis, mistake unfortunately giving for just wealth. No, giving is of your spirit, of yourself, of your time, of your qualities, of the knowledge that Allah has given you to to give that for I mean, the sake I'm, of I'm betterment witness. of others. You're always like in the forefront whenever there's a need, mashallah. May Allah increase. Um, what about, how did you control friends and children? Like your children, did you draw a line at some point? Okay, yes, you know, you can go to XYZ's house, but you can't go to, uh, you know, somebody else's house. Uh, did you draw a it's line a in terms of how did you see your children and their friendships? So interesting, uh, with our older son, my, my son, my 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 oldest son, who you met once, I think. So, you know, he calls himself the guinea pig because we had to learn parenting through him. SubhanAllah. And uh, uh, that was our, our most difficult task. What we ended up doing, and, and someone had told my wife this, that instead of losing control when they are at your friend's house, you have to really make the sacrifice and we because he had friends that were muslim and non-muslim and we were going to you know how do we control so we wanted to basically control for character so we looked for character and we said you know what we're not going to define who you're going to be friends with just because the person's not muslim i can't prevent you that's one thing i think it's really important for muslims to understand in this country don't control that control for character because in that you're going to find if they have good parenting if they have good uh, social lives, brothers and sisters, are they connected to their families? So we actually right. did that. Like you're allowed to marry a Christian girl. I mean, in terms of the more the commonness of right. the, the morality. Right. The, exactly. So the common thread where you're not going to get into trouble with is you control for character. Then we control for environment. So it's much easier to control when they're in your environment. So then we used to have them over at our place more than him going to their places. Hmm. And I specifically remember that, especially when he was in high school, um, we'd have his friends over and say, you know what, you can, you want to play video games, invite Johnny or whoever you're, you know, Eric or whatever, and, and have them um, play here. Hmm. And then we used to make food for them. And that used to be actually our informal dawah. And now we were known his, you know, Rob, Rob comes over all the time and he knows that, you know, we cook certain things and we talk about recipes and all this other stuff. And even now, mashallah, they're good friends. And, um, uh, the, what that did was not just that, it solidified um, us finding out who his friends were. It also allowed us to impart a certain level of our deen onto those people that this is who their parents are. It's not like they're some weirdos, like, you know, Allah's parents are not some weird people from an alien planet. They're, you know, just, <laughs> they're, they're human beings. And the third thing it did is it established um, a connection with their parents. And so now I'm connected with their parents and um, it was good for my business, but more so it was good for the community that we were connected as Muslims in a non-Muslim community. And they saw that we are in the business of service and character and respect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did you, um, were there a lot of rules in your house or very few rules? How would you define that? We got... <laughs> You know, I bet you my cousin's going to watch this 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 video of yours, um, and 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 I will tell you they'll probably agree with it. Compared to honestly, Sheikh, compared to a lot of the Desi families that you see, we've had relatively few rules. We, we you know that were that were rules rules. We didn't have like here's a contract you're going to sign it if you don't you know um, if they're coming home late you know like the, there's a lot of stuff like that. We were. There were times when, when our kids were teenagers, I bet you my family was, we were chastised hmm. overtly and covertly. They, people were looking at us like, what the heck is these people doing? Like living in America, having so few rules for their kids and their kids are able to, our kids were given a lot more freedoms compared to other kids. I remember that, especially in my, compared to my families. And, you know, I mean, ironically now our families are asking us to, you know, how to raise their kids. And we tell them, you know, you have to, like that fifth, pin, fifth point I told you, um, don't smother, mm. parent. 
Like be a parent, be a friend, be there, know that, have open communication, have mutual respect. One thing I learned from a very a big scholar from India, uh, I, I think he was, al- my father was alive when we, he and I attended a, a gathering in, in a queen's masjid. Hmm. And the scholar says something very interesting. And he said, when a child is before puberty, when a child, he's, he's a child, he or she is a child. But after, after that child becomes a teenager, reaches puberty, that child becomes another, uh, fard, uh, you know, he, he's, a, he's a citizen of your home. Mm. And as a citizen of your home, that child has equal mashwara and opinion and consultation. If you do not consult your child mm. in the daily happenings of the home, then you will lose that child's opinion outside the home and therefore you will lose the child so mm-hmm. even in matters of cooking and matters of excursions mm-hmm. and matters of different things we ask our children where should we go for our family outing this summer mm-hmm. where should we what should mom cook we've got chicken mom's like okay so and this is a and this is interesting i don't know it's it, it, hopefully it answers one of the questions but almost every day my wife will will say to the kids okay we've taken out chicken or goat or whatever what should i make Mm. to uh you know what should we do for today what do you think the new that involves the girls specifically but even even the boys Mm. that you know are they in the mood for a little cheap meal or you know we're trying to go as as healthy as possible in my house so Mm. you know like do you want your like get the veggies in if everybody is involved in making a decision that's almost you know sometimes as mundane as daily cooking then they will take part in it's much easier to facilitate the taking part of enjoying the meal, of enjoying the conversation with the meal, of then cleaning afterwards and giving duties for that. Then also, if, for the mother, it becomes more purposeful. It does, hundred percent. It becomes more purposeful because you know because of the mashwara. It's like okay, we're going to do this. It's kind of like we're doing this, even though maybe the mother is doing ninety percent of the work, but it's still like kind of like as a team in a sense, right? So I think that is a very good idea is to take uh, kind of like feedback every day. This is something you can do every single day. Right? Every single day. Ask them. They, help, they hold an opinion because guess what? They're giving their opinions to so many of their friends. And we learned this from our, old, from our son, from our oldest son, where, you know, we realized that he was involved in major, major decisions that helped his friends. And now we involve him, the more we involve him in our day-to-day life about strengths that he has. Because keep in mind, as an amana, as as a trust from Allah, we notice all five of our kids have different strengths. Mm. Most parents don't realize that Allah has given you kids so that you are to be completed, okay? Not so that you can be a general in an army. Mm. Yeah. You know, if you recognize your child's strength and if you, if you let, let go of the ego, then you will humble yourself and ask opinions of your child. You would be surprised at the insight that that child has in so many different aspects of life. Hmm. Here, here's a question that maybe doesn't have a concrete right answer, but I think it's important to get your feedback because I know you're, these are probably things that you've thought about in great detail. Uh, public school versus Islamic school versus the madrasa system. And I know partly has to do with the personality of the child, yeah. partly has to do with, you know, di- there, there's more than one factor involved in that. So how would you home 100%, 100%, yeah. Home- Islamic school, madrasa mm-hmm. system. I, I would really say, I would really say yes, 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 and yes. And that that happened with that exactly happened with us. It's a great question, and we get asked that a lot. Our older son was not suited. To, I started homeschooling up until eighth grade. All the kids were homeschooled, and I started homeschooling. He was not suited to homeschool. I couldn't find a proper tutor for him. I I did it, and it didn't work. And so in eighth grade, I let him go into public school, and um, there were certain pitfalls. I was in the community. I wasn't as known as I am now in the community. So he had. Um, certain things, but he found his niche and he found his calling and he found his, you know, his friends at the, he was, he, he went, he played, sw- he played tennis and he joined the swim team and, um, and he found his, his, his friends. 
um, the my my daughter went homeschool all the way. Then she went to college, um, ECC, and then um, graduated from from Buff State. And um, only, you know, and went to, to, to that route. And mashallah, she has a master's in education now. And she's teaching. Mm-hmm. And my the second, the second son, my third child, he, who you know, and he went, um, it was a mix. He was the one, he actually went, um, the oldest one went to madrasa. Um, and, and, and this is the only comment I'm going to make about madrasa in this and and I hope that whoever watches this um, will take heed on this. His first teacher of Quran was I, I, I to this day I love him. He's he was so loved to him that if he had stayed in the madrasa, then I think my my older son would have finished memorization of the Quran. For whatever reason, the teacher had to move, mm. and our older son was never. Uh, comfortable or compatible with the teachers, subsequent teachers. And there were six of them approximately. And it really changed the whole dimension. It, it, it changed the whole uh, so, so here's di- a, direction for him. An important question for, I think, parents is that because my dad had to deal with similar situations where he had to switch the educational platforms for various reasons. But it's it's a really like it's a really hard decision, I guess. And you have to really be empathetic and know your child's personality. Because I think a lot of parents, for example, they may put their children either in a madrasa or Islamic school or wherever, or homeschool them. How do you have your pulse on the child that this is not working? I think is, is, is because a lot of people like, uh, and I'll just say, I'll say this is that a lot of times people suffer because they're in a situation they don't want to be in, but they're in it because of their parents, right? Yes. And, and, and so yeah. and parents are, don't have the communication or the empathy to uh, adjust themselves according to the needs of the child. Right. I also think the channels of communication with mutual respect have to be really created at a younger, much younger age than parents are creating it. Mm. You know, you can't, you can't wait for your daughter or son to be married before you realize that, Oh, I should have had communication with this person. Mm. It doesn't work that way. Mm. If you want, you know, you have to work at, it's it's about relationships. So, um, you know, in relationships with your child, we have, and we, we did this with our younger one, our younger one went to Madrasa. He came back crying and he said, I, I can't do this because uh, the teacher is very strict. Mm-hmm. And so I, I'm sorry, but I can't learn like this. And he was six years old, seven, very small. He came to his mother and we said, you know what? It's fine. So, I mean, even at that age, fourth grade, fourth grade yeah. So 10, yeah, fourth grade. So, you know, and, and, and he said, oh, we said, okay, let, let's do it. And I think, the psyche because children learn to speak much later than they learn to think right so they the 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 words come out much later they're and even as a child up until the age of 10 they're absorbing a lot of stuff my daughter tells me now after she got married she said do you remember when i was nine years old and yada 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 and i and i'm I'm like okay i can't believe you remember that Mm -hmm. you know the little things that they remember in their psyche they weren't able to communicate it with words but they have it and so those those years are really important for us to develop that bond and like i said uh one of the parents has to be really soft in that time and specifically the mother because she gave birth and then you switch the roles i mean i can't i can't stress that enough i mean to the point now where i sometimes get you know and, and now my wife is here so she's going to probably yell at me after this call, but that's okay. You know, I sometimes, she, you know, I, I try to make sure that the kids know that, you know, the credit all goes to their mom. Really, I didn't have anything to do with it um, because they always turn to me first in trying to get stuff done or get make decisions or, you know, can we do this? But behind closed doors, one thing I did fail to mention, like you said, establishing the relationship, but behind closed doors, if you have to, arguments are going to happen, but try not to have disagreements or huge arguments in front of your children 
especially when the oldest turns two. This was when my mentors taught me a long, long time ago. When, when the oldest child turns two years old, try never to have an argument, um, hold it in behind closed doors, wait 24 hours, and then talk to your spouse thereafter when the kids are not there. And when you're able to, if you're able to do that and hold yourself, it will save you from a lot of hassle and stress. Believe me, it's such a beautiful thing if you can do that. How did you do the religious part of the tarbiyah? Subhanallah. Um, my mother has had my mother, uh, my father in law, mother in law. Um, a lot of the right mentors, you know, he, they have a, they have they have four khalas. My kids have four khalas, and uh, one puppy. You know, um, um, my sister and my wife's sister, and uh, and allowing allowing them to have access to all those people mm-hmm. is really important. Family was really important, and then of course my father's side of the family, allowing them to meet when uh, you know uh, to go to different places and to partake of different things and then ask questions. Oh, is this right? Is this not right? Because a lot of the, you know, in the Khala side, they're quite, you know, we have um, some who are, mashallah, we are blessed that we have some scholars and Hafiz of Quran um, and uh, even the Khalas and, 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 and learning from them. Some, one of them actually uh, uh, is in Texas and they, 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 they are running a madrasa. And mm-hmm. so, you know, having that, that, that conversation and that, uh, connection with them is very, very important. So family is huge. I think that's, that's really um, family and good friends, good people to associate with uh, is, is really good. I think it's, it's essential. It's really the, the solution to daycare for Muslims in America. If I were to pinpoint it is, you know, you talk about your community within a community without this aspect of that, it, it can never work. So allowing right. so the, the children are spending time with the grandparents instead of let's say at a daycare. Right? Yeah. You know. Essential. Yeah. My mother, my mother still is much closer. I would say my mother to my older son, my mother is closer to my older son than she is to uh than he is to his parents. Actually, I'm uh, in a sense. Even like in our house, like all the kids that we have are much closer to, you know, the grandma. Yeah. You know, Tamara's mo- mother. They're, they're, yeah. They say things to her. They don't say it to anyone else. Right. That's very interesting. You know, uh, I yeah. guess e- even when we look at the Islamic tradition, grandfathers are referred to so much, you know, you know, jaddi, you know, when they refer to the Prophet وسلم, for example. Yeah. And, and many like Ka'ab bin Malik re- narrates like from his grandfather. And so it's like, I think that... Uh, the the parting of families in the modern time has has been a disservice we need to bring the families back as much as possible in like one place so they're all there yeah or you can go yeah. meet them too but not uh, necessarily not necessarily in the same house you know, no 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 that's that's, that's all that's actually, one place. <laughs> yeah that's you know i i also uh say that uh, uh in you know uh Sometimes in-laws in the house cannot, or, or sometimes too many joint family doesn't always work. Right. Yeah. Everyone and everyone's situation is very, very different. Uh, so that, yeah. Um, but but definitely in having the grandparents in close proximity is is a great blessing. Mm. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Great blessing. It 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 gives cohesion to the overall. Yeah. Uh, mother parent and then they have their parents and then they see oh my father listens to his mother okay well i guess this you yeah. know that, that whole picture is is missing right and then it's just oh dad just tells me what to do and i guess i have to do it but when you see like there's parents and then grandparents and then the grandparents are being treated in a certain way and then now you understand okay i'm part of this you know process right. uh, and so that's uh mashallah very good um also when you were strict how strict and and let me just define something here is is that uh um there's a difference between punishment and discipline in the sense that punishment is just like you're lashing out right you're upset and you're lashing out versus discipline is like 
well, that's the rule. And I'm sorry, I don't want to discipline you, but right. I have to because I already told you several times that I don't want this done and you did it. So I have to follow through. Uh, a lot of times parents will tell their children, if you do this, this will be the consequences, but then they have a very hard time following through. Or on the other side, they'll lash out as soon as they're angry. And so what do you have to say about that? In, 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 as yeah, I think it's, I think it's really, you know, uh, controlling the anger, I think really solves, you know, that goes along with uh, ego is the enemy and letting that go. It's hand in hand. It's so important. And that, unfortunately, a lot of our, our people suffer with that. And that, that makes the relationship suffer with the spouse. So if the relationship is going to suffer with the spouse, it's going to suffer with the kids. Mm. So learning, right. You know, having that patience, um, uh, you know, I was taught the 24 hour rule. If you're upset about something, wait 24 hours and then discuss it after then your anger will have subsided and you can talk about it in the past. So that's the first thing. And second thing is, uh, the, the child's, the other thing I was taught was the child's uh, sense of self-esteem gets destroyed if you are constantly chastising the child at the time of making that mistake. Mm. If you bring it up shortly thereafter or at a later time and discuss it privately, it not only allows for better correction, but it allows for a trust to build mm. between you and the child. Mm. So those two things was it was it was a journey. I was taught that, and then I've been blessed with a very loud voice. I don't need a microphone, as you can tell, and from this thing, you know, this is just. And uh, so even my kids, I alhamdulillah never really had to, but never the the younger four, I really never, uh, we never, I never physically touched them at all. It's just you know, I I will I would yell, and they would get so scared and start crying. So about something, you know, like, um, and that would come from the mother. So if the mom is saying something and they're not listening to her, then I would, would start raising my voice and then they would know that we're both on the same page. And that was when they were young. And, you know, now um, I'll, I'll joke things like, you know, please, if you don't stop doing this, then I'm going to start crying, you know, say something so bizarre and, you know, left field that then, then they're forced to like say something. Okay. You know, you know, you go so low that they're like, what, what did he just say? I was like, yeah, please just, can you just stop? I'm just going to start crying. Cause you know, I can't, I can't beat you. I can't do anything. So I'm just going to, you know, it's that type of thing. So we have that, that relationship. And I, and I, and like I said, I learned it from the people that I followed in parenting, you know, how they raise their kids and I modeled and mimicked after them. So, uh, there's a verse in the Quran that says, uh, talking about, you can say this kind of like balance, right? So on the one side, Allah says, They're your enemies, right? Beware of them. But then on the other side, the same verse is saying, So, if you're kind to them, Tasfahu is like to turn the other, you know, safha is like a page, to turn the other page that I find very interesting because it's kind of like telling the child, I know what you did, but I'm just not saying anything. Like, you know, that I know that I know that, you know, and you just yeah. kind of like give him the look and it's like, that's all it takes. And then, and then uh, you forgive them. So what were uh, like in terms of, not necessarily always bringing up, just giving them that look uh, versus having that conversation, look, this was wrong, but being gentle uh, versus, you know, just forgiving them because maybe they hurt the feelings of the parent. Um, what do you have to say about that? So, you know, on the, the struggle between like, okay, they're doing something wrong and then the different ways to deal with that. And interesting, that doesn't end, Sheikh. Uh, you, you know, even when they're older. Very mm. recently, and I'll tell you, my younger son brought this brought this up to me. So he and the older one and I were involved in. Uh, they were in. It was a transaction where the older one was uh, bought a car, and uh, you know, he the gentleman who he they made good money uh, from the car, and the gentleman brought him a check, and my older one was in New York City, and he took the check and he deposited it. 
and he gave him the car. Mm. And that was a fine. So I texted him. I said, did you get a certified check? How did he give you a check? You know, like, he said, no, he just gave me a regular personal check. It was about 10000 or something dollars or something, right? Mm. And my younger son, I, I, I called him and I said, you know, I'm really upset because he could have lost $10,000. What if the person gave him a personal check, ran away with the car, now he's got the car, the keys and everything. And he said, yeah, he said, you should, you should mention it to him. So I called my son, my older one. And I said, you know, I'm just going to let you know, like, I'm, I'm really upset. Can you please make sure that next time you're doing this, just, just consult with me. Like, I, you know, you know, I care about you. And I, I literally, I was very, I was, I was yelling mm. and I don't do this with him at all. I mean, this is a 24 year old. Mm. He said, okay, thank you. you know, I, and then he actually texted me an apology. And he said, you know, you're right. I should have done that. Inshallah. And next time until I will. So then I told my younger one and I said, why do you think this is? He says, because Abuji, you never raise your voice with him. In mm. two years, I haven't seen you do this. Mm. If you were habitual in saying something wrong, saying something and raising your voice, it would have been the boy who cried wolf. But because you never do it, when you picked up the phone and did it, he knew this was emergency. And I think this is something that you can extrapolate and all parents at all ages can say when you when your kid is, or even your spouse, if they're used to you yelling and see, doing that all the time, if your habit is criticizing, then you become chatter and you become less important to them in their brain. So therefore, when it is important, they will not lend an ear. Uh, one of the Islamic schools here that you know about, I think you're in the board. Um or were, I'm not sure. But either way, in, I teach one of the classes there, right? And so I've seen the kids are so used to not responding if you're not yelling. Like they are, they are, it's like the response and stimuli. It's like they only respond if they hear you yelling. So if you tell them, okay, class, be quiet. It doesn't mean anything until you raise your voice and say it. And it's like, why do I have to do this? Because, and the reason is because this is what they've been trained this is the response right. to that they've gotten uh and so you know so i think uh it's right because when it will be really important and you really want to make your point and and if you if you're always yelling you're not going to be able to do anything more right so if you if you're if you're generally calmer and then now when you're upset you can actually use that card it'll be much more effective and like you said, and that will cause the child to reflect, okay, wait, this is like serious, you know? Yeah. And then the response is that, dad, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Or, right. And so... And that actually, interestingly enough, that incident, I would bet and say that that incident uh, happened six, seven months ago. It's actually brought us closer. Oh, well, you know, sure. because we recognize that 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 yelling was from the heart was for love i didn't want him to be out 10 grand right right yeah. and so th that brings me to my point i think parents are so hell-bent in not having the kids repeat their own mistakes what the parents made that they don't let the kids make their make small mistakes and as a result they end up making bigger mistakes mm. so if you allow the kids to make small mistakes then talk about it then correct it you will prevent them from making larger ones mm in your absence right you have to let them make mistakes so that they yeah. you know otherwise they'll never know what to do once they make a mistake right it's it's so that process okay make a mistake and now let's talk about it so you recognize what it means to make choices and 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 how to like deal with making mistakes um and okay. then also allowing uh, having that open channel of communication that being that person that it's okay that you've made a mistake, come to me and tell me, and we'll figure it out together in how to correct it. Versus, oh, you know, if the child is fearful of the parent, then they'll never come to tell you. And then that leads to more mistakes, hmm. chances of more mistakes. That's right. Yes, absolutely. Um, what did you do in terms of children working? Uh, and I'm thinking in terms of, you know, for the sake of responsibility versus... Uh -huh. I don't want them to work because they'll be out there and they can be influenced uh, by X, Y, Z. Right. What did you do with that? 
so biggest mistake I think parents make um, for, and that's the thing that, you know, how I was raised versus how I raised my kids. Uh, the boys specifically, we, um, we uh, uh, stopped paying for their cell phone at the age of 15. And I would, I would stress, wow. mm -hmm, I would stress that to all parents. Maximum so 16. Because, you know, the Quran says, don't give the foolish people their money. And I think one of the things that parents don't do is they never teach children about saving and money management. It's like a whole conversation to build a relationship with, really. Um, but I think that's really awesome you did that because yeah. uh, it's about teaching them the sense of responsibility from the very beginning. I think a lot of parents, they... Uh, you know, they smother their child and then in the process, they give them everything they want and they don't have any experience with dealing with the outside world. So this is like a good balance. You got the dean, you're working. So uh, please continue on this. And it, it cripples the child. You, you know, we, we, they complain about how the kids are today. Well, we, have, we, ha we are the reason for that complaint. We are, we are responsible for them being entitled because we wanted to give them stuff that we didn't have growing up. Or, you know, I came from Bangladesh and I didn't have this and I came from Pakistan and I didn't have this. And in India, we used to have two bananas and not three. And now, you know, everything is there. So my kid should, no, that's the worst. Uh, don't cripple them. They're handicapping them. The kid doesn't know anything. Uh, so at 16, with the girls, uh, we actually uh, uh, imparted at a very early age financial education, as you mentioned. So the, um, Dave Ramsey uh, wrote the Total Money Makeover. His daughter is Rachel Cruz. My daughter, true story, the one who got married, she all the books, she, she never bought a book in her life. She would rent all the books from the library. She read all of the books about you know financial education. The one book that she bought before going and getting married was Rachel Cruz's book about managing money and uh, you know staying on debit and 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 now she's you know the, she and her husband are saving up for a house and she understands the importance of having three or four bank accounts and saving and and then of course bringing it into a halal option and, and imparting them about the you know the, the the evils of interest and all that other stuff so we actually actively took part in that mm -hmm. um created savings account for them uh, um, in a checking account, joint checking account in the banks, and then had them do money, money management. But very, very important to teach the girls, in my opinion, essential, essential to teach your daughters about money management. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. That's extremely important. And also then uh, encouraging them about not just managing money, but also the different types of home businesses that there are that they can do. So, you know, do you want to like, you know, do it yourself crafts and then, you know, online selling and e-commerce and all that other stuff. There's so many things that they can do. So encouraging them for that. Um, that's what we did definitely did for our girls, but for the boys, yeah, 15, you get cut off. I, I'm sorry. You, you use the Wi-Fi, you pay your own bill and there's the cricket store or you go somewhere and here it is. Figure it out. What do you do when children say, well, they do that or that child does? Well, he's allowed to do that and she's allowed to do that. And how did you deal with that? Uh, last time I checked, they are not living under this roof. Just saying. <laughs> if they were, they my wouldn't house, be allowed to do it. <laughs> my house. If my they house. were, they wouldn't be allowed to do it. And, 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 and they and so the pain. So we imparted pain. OK, positive pain not through punishment, but through money, but through, you know, taking away money mm. for, for, for the, for the boys. And they thank us now, mm. you know, they, they, they think, I mean, you know, as you know, like the younger one, you know, people said, you know, your, your son is 22 and he's getting married. Like he's not, well, yeah. I mean, he was ready to get married last year uh, because he understood how to take care of himself, uh, his finances, and another person in his life uh, and do it with a balance because we allowed him to make certain mistakes and learn financial education at a very young age. Mm. Mm. I think uh, you gave us a, a lot of good points, mashallah. Um, I'm sorry it was so long. I apologize. I know no, that no, no, this no, is no, weird. No, like, I, I think this is extremely important. Um, do you have any words about eating together? Yes, I, 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 I can't thank you enough for that khutbah that you made. I actually shared it with my kids. The essential, I, I, I think 
in, in, in all practicality, because I don't think it's, you can, I would love for it to happen every day, but like we're inshallah, we're about to go have dinner now. Right. So they're waiting for me to go have dinner, make it an event, make it fun. Don't engage in the mundane and try to be consistent and disciplined about eating together in the home without screens at least twice or three times a week. That would, would be my humble request. My last question, uh, sleep times. Mm, that's been a, that's been a struggle. Insomnia and, you know, teenagers not being able to go to sleep or sleeping late or using their time in their bedrooms with the door closed on screen time, not negatively or positively, just the habit. Yeah. Uh, how do you, we learn from a we learn from a, a family that we are interacting with now, uh, and inshallah, I think I'm planning on doing it. Uh, hopefully, if my daughters ever t make time to watch this video and get to this part, this is definitely about them. But uh, so I'll tell them to watch the video with a foreshadow of stuff to come. But the, you know, I think 10 p.m. and then they this family does it, and we haven't done it yet. But inshallah, I, I really like this idea. We're going to collaborate. And we're going to come together. And we're going to say, listen, if I put my screens away at 10 p.m. and they put it in a little basket in the living room, so all the kids they have to have their phones and their screens in a basket in the living room by 10 p.m. They're mm -hmm. shut off completely, mm -hmm. and so in their in their rooms when they're sleeping, there is no internet and there's no devices. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. Or, please do not be like a, 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 a kernel or pejorative or, you know, uh, might is right on this. You have to do it collaboratively. You can't just be like, this is wrong and da, 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 da. No, no. You have to do it in a way that they feel that it's the right thing to do mm -hmm. by talking about the importance of uh, why it's necessary for your brain to rejuvenate mm -hmm. and then also the virtues of it. Hmm. Okay, mashallah. I know you have to go eat dinner, so we'll leave it at here for today. And uh, inshallah, we'll continue this at another time in maybe a few months, inshallah. Sure. So and and much, well, what we could do is, well, Yaakum, what we can do is, if there are any questions that arise from this, I'm sure people are going to have a lot of questions uh, when they watch this, then we can take care of answering those questions, inshallah, in the next few months, inshallah. Absolutely. Okay. Jazakumullah khairan. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. And uh, inshallah, take care. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaykum as-salamu wa rahmatullah.